Welcome to TUSD School Safety Low Light Firearms Training. This online training is mandatory prior to participating in the active fire drill scheduled at the range. At the end of this short online training, there will be a quiz to verify that you have obtained the necessary information to proceed to the range portion of the training. As you proceed through this online training, you will see several different techniques for utilizing flashlights with your department issued sidearm. You are encouraged to practice these techniques so that you will find which one or ones work best for you prior to going out to the range to shoot. However, with this in mind, if you are going to practice with your firearm and flashlight, you must remember the following safety practices. Too many people become complacent and chuck the 40 rules out the window simply because they need to get some dry fire practice in. That's foolish. The purpose of dry firing is to ingrain certain physical habits into your memory. So deeply ingrain them that your body will automatically behave that way under stress. You do not want to ingrain poor safety habits. Dry firing without following the four rules is worse than not dry firing at all because it accomplishes the exact opposite of its intended purpose. Make your weapon safe. In a safe location, remove the magazine from your weapon and then remove the live round from the chamber. Make sure you visually check and then place your finger in the chamber to physically verify that the weapon is safe. Here are the four universal rules of gun safety and how they apply to dry fire. Rule 1. All guns are always loaded, means that the safety rules always apply. You must always treat every firearm with the cautious respect you would give it if you were knew for sure that it was loaded and able to fire. When you follow this rule, even after you have just checked to see that your gun is unloaded, you still never do anything with it that you would not be willing to do with a loaded gun. All other safety rules follow from this one, cardinal rule. Some people apparently believe that merely checking to see the gun is unloaded means that you can treat it like a toy, that you can point it at your friends to pose for a picture, or at your training partners for disarming practice, or at a flimsy interior wall to check trigger function. That's a foolish, foolish idea that kills a certain number of people every single year. Never, ever, ever point any gun loaded or not, at any human being, you are not willing to shoot. Rule 2. Never point the gun at anything you are not willing to destroy simply states the logical consequence of Rule 1. When you choose a direction for dry fire, you must choose a direction in which you would be willing to fire a loaded weapon. Never lose track of where your gun points. Never allow it to point at your dog, at the big screen TV you can't afford to replace, at a friend, or at an heirloom vase. Point it at something that would result only in minor and acceptable property damage if the gun were loaded, not injury or death. Please note that the word willing, as used or implied in the first two rules, does not mean that you really want to shoot a hole in your subflooring, or that you have a great and burning desire to blast that bucket full of dry sand from your safe backstop all over your bedroom carpet. It only means that you are aware that other safety measures may fail, and that you are willing to sacrifice these items if you make a mistake. It means you reasonably believe that only minor property damage, not physical or emotional tragedy, will happen if you err. One of the reasons people dry fire is to learn Rule 3. Keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on target. This rule needs to be contained not just in your thinking brain, but also in your body's physical response to holding the gun in your hand. It should take a conscious effort of will to put your finger on the trigger. You should never, ever, ever find your finger resting on the trigger or inside the trigger guard when you didn't consciously put it there. Keep your finger out of the trigger guard and indexed high on the frame until your sights are on a target. What's a target? A target is anywhere you have deliberately chosen as the best place for a bullet to land in a given situation. It can be a piece of paper, a criminal intruder, or a falling steel plate. It can be a particular spot on the living room floor, a thick stack of foam books, or a painting hung on a basement wall. The important thing is that the target is deliberately chosen. Never put your finger on the trigger for dry fire or for any other reason including disassembling the gun until you have deliberately chosen the best place for the bullet to land in that situation. Rule 4. Be sure of your target and what is beyond it is particularly important when dry firing. Because you are following Rule 1, you know that the gun in your hand could be deadly so you are not going to point it at any flimsy interior wall that you know would never stop a bullet or at your own reflection in the bathroom mirror. You won't dry fire at the TV. Instead, you'll set up a useful target with a safe backstop. If you cannot set up a safe backstop, then you must not dry fire there. 
You might be asking right about now, why are we going through this training? More than two out of every three officer homicides and most violent crimes occur during the hours of darkness or in diminished light. Over 70% of all officer involved shootings take place in low light environments, yet most training takes place under normal lighting conditions. The conditions these officers were operating in at the time of their shooting would equate them to being legally blind. Even day shift officers regularly operate in low light conditions when searching unlit structures, closed schools, basements, and access tunnels. Past court case and lawsuits dictate that we must train our officers in real life conditions not only to avoid lawsuits, but more importantly, so that you will survive. Remember, this online training is mandatory prior to participating in the active fire drills scheduled at the range. At the end of this online training, there will be a quiz to verify that you have obtained the necessary information to proceed to the range portion of the training. The human eye uses both rod cells and cone cells to adjust to the varying degree of light. Cone cells are used primarily for high degrees of light or daylight situations. Cone cells are located in the central portion of the retina. Rod cells are approximately a thousand times more sensitive to light. They perceive only shades of gray. They lack precision for shapes, distance, and depth. And images caught in your peripheral vision are not clear. As light decreases, the rods take over the vision from the cones. Things that might affect your low light vision are age, smoking, low levels of vitamin A, and high altitude. After eyes adjust to low light, you lose color and depth perception. There will be a small blind spot directly in front of your eyes. Remember, it will take between 20 and 40 minutes to obtain your full night vision. The ability to see under adverse light conditions varies between individuals. This ability is also age related. Additionally, the abilities to see under reduced illumination, to see past oncoming glare, and to adapt from light to dark quickly all peak during teenage years. Other factors affecting our ability to see include smoking, alcohol, drugs, and medication. Although human vision is capable of very keen visual acuity, standard 2020 vision is only achievable under relatively high levels of illumination. There are five primary uses for the flashlight in modern law enforcement tactics. They are searching, navigating, threat identification, control, and communication. Let's take a closer look at each of these applications. Searching. When utilizing the flashlight during a search, the primary use of the light is to investigate the problem or to locate a threat. Use of gun mounted lights requires that you either search with the muzzle, which causes the major problem of pointing a loaded gun at everything you shine your light on, or use something like a light colored ceiling or wall to reflect light into the area that you wish to illuminate. A wiser choice might be to supplement the gun mounted light with a handheld one, perhaps linked to the non-gun hand wrist with a lanyard. Navigating. This is when an officer uses the light to find the optimum pathway and to avoid obstacles. Threat identification. When the light is used to determine friend or foe. Whether or not you're fond of working a flashlight and a firearm simultaneously, you certainly need enough light, ambient or artificial, to positively identify your threat before you fire. Target identification and threat assessment is critical. In a study by Geller and Scoot of officer-involved shootings nationwide, 25% involved unarmed suspects. Control. This is accomplished when you use the light to control and direct the suspect's movements and to restrict their ability to receive visual data. 80% or more depending on the situation of our sensory information is received visually. Shining a sufficiently powerful light into dark adapted eyes will cause the subject to experience momentary blindness and loss of balance. As such, a properly applied and sufficiently powerful flashlight beam can be considered a viable, non-lethal force option that can be used to facilitate compliance or to ease the application of arrest and control techniques. Communication. Use the light to communicate location and direction to other officers. Putting the spot of your light on the area of interest and informing your partner that the threat is on my blinking light is more informative and precise than pointing in the same direction and saying, he's over there. There are 10 key principles of low light tactics. The first is, read the light and adapt. Upon entering a low light threat environment, assess the varying levels of light. Is it completely dark? Are parts of the environment partially lit? And most importantly, are you backlit by a door, window, or other light source? The rule of thumb is, 
all dark holes, or any area too dark to see into, contain threats, and should therefore be treated as such until proven otherwise. A proper assessment of the prevailing lighting conditions will dictate whether you use the flashlight intermittently, like a blinking light, or whether you choose to leave it on constantly to throw up an impenetrable wall of light. Secondly, operate from the lowest level of light. As a general rule, moving to the lowest level of light provides more concealment than operating in areas with higher levels of light. The idea is to reduce a subject or aggressor's ability to see you while improving your ability to see without being seen. Time and light equals time as a target. Thirdly, avoid or control backlighting. In a low light environment, you are most visible and vulnerable when backlit. Do not stop in doorways or allow your partner to make your silhouette an easy target by turning on his flashlight behind you. One of the most common low light mistakes is to face a threat that is located in a dark area while you are standing in front of a more brightly lit area. Having the moon at your back when entering a dark warehouse is enough to make you backlit. How to equalize backlighting will be covered under principle number 7, dominate with light. Fourthly, see from the threat's viewpoint. With practice, skilled tacticians will continuously analyze their position and sight picture from the viewpoint of any possible threats in the environment. For instance, if you go down that hallway, what picture are you presenting to anyone inside the darkened room at the end? This concept, combined with an awareness of the light levels around, behind, and in front of you, will help to dictate the best way to approach a given tactical problem. Fifth, light and move. While the flashlight can give you a tactical advantage, it can also become a liability if you make it easy for an opponent to locate and or fix your position. Until you have located the threat, it is better to use the light in brief flashes, taking care to move to a new position after every flash. Keeping the flashlight on continuously may make searching easier, as well as more reassuring, but it also makes you a target while letting the aggressor know how far you are from his or her position, what direction you are coming from, and when you will be there. Sixth, intermittent use of light at random heights. Unless the threat is contained and or neutralized, holding the flashlight in front of center of mass is the least recommended technique. Experience from actual gunfights and force on force training shows that when given the opportunity, aggressors will shoot at the light. Activating the light away from the center line at intermittent and irregular intervals while alternating the light position from low to high will confuse your opponent while making it harder for them to determine your position. From the perspective of an aggressor or threat hiding in the building you are searching, it is easy to follow your progress and to guess your position if you search with your light in constant on mode, but it is much harder and often disorienting due to the stroboscopic effect to follow your progress if you use random intermittent lighting. As the searcher, would you rather be predictable and easy to track or disorienting and difficult to locate? Seventh, dominate with light. In most cases, constant light should only be used in two situations. One, when you are backlit and cannot move to a less backlit position, such as when entering the front door of a building with a street light at your back. And two, when your subject has been located and is not an immediate threat, for example, not in a position to fire on you. In the first instance, dominating with constant light will reduce your silhouette to anyone hiding within the doorway. But you ask, won't my light give me away? The answer, of course, is yes, but conducting a building search is an exercise in compromise. A perfect solution is not always possible, so you do the best you can to increase your odds of success. If you leave your light off, your silhouette is still clearly visible to anyone inside. By flooding the doorway in the room beyond with light, you take away your opponent's ability to see while increasing your own. In situations where you are not backlit and therefore not visible, intermittent lighting is the better choice. Once the aggressor has been located, and is determined not to be an immediate threat, keep the light on and in his or her eyes. Turning the light off at this point only gives the aggressor the ability to move to another position, thereby forcing you to begin the search again. Once the threat is located, dominate with light and pin the suspect in position. Many agencies train their officers to keep the light directed at the suspect's hands so they can see a potential weapon. Unfortunately, this practice allows the suspect to regain his or her vision. Using a sufficiently powerful light with a good quality beam, an officer can place the center spot of the beam directly in the suspect's eyes while still having more than enough light to see the suspect's hands. Eighth, align three things. When searching for or engaging a known deadly force threat, your weapon, flashlight, and eyes should be aligned to the same point of focus. If you locate the threat with your eyes and flashlight 
but have your weapon down and out of the fight, there will be no time to bring all three together if the threat engages you. This does not suggest that you should always keep your weapon presented in a firing position while searching. Let the threat level and agency protocol determine how you present your weapon. But if you are searching for a threat that has already demonstrated intent to respond with lethal force, you should be prepared to instantly defend yourself. Students under duress during force-on-force -force training have often been observed to incorrectly corner with either their weapon or head first. The officer who leads with his or her weapon while cornering, or slicing the pie for example, holds his or her gun around a corner without being able to see what it is pointed at, is telegraphing his or her position to anyone on the other side of the corner. For reference, see figure 1. The officer who leads with his or her head, or peeks his or her head around a corner while his or her weapon is not in a usable position, has the problem of not being able to immediately fire if faced with a threat. For these reasons, it is recommended that eyes, weapon, and flashlight be aligned in the same general direction when searching for a threat that is known to be dangerous and likely to be encountered. For this reference, see figure number 3. However, the final determination for how you present and carry your weapon should be determined by agency protocol. Ninth, carry more than one light. Flashlights are mechanical devices and even the best can fail. This concept is no different than carrying a backup weapon. If you need one, carry two. Always remember the tactical trinity. One is none, two is one, three is key. If you have only one light, your primary light, and it dies, you are without a light. If you carry a backup light and one goes out, at least you have one good working light still available. If you also have a weapons mounted light, you can utilize a two-handed weapon hold or provide additional lighting with a handheld light. This is the ideal situation. The final principle of low light tactics is breathe and relax. Under stress, human beings tend to hyperventilate. While this response may have been appropriate when our ancestors had to fend off the attacks of wild beasts, it is counterproductive in a modern threat environment. Breath control is the key to remaining calm, in control, and aware. Make a point of checking your breath regularly in a threat environment. If your breath is out of control, you are out of control. There are more than six handheld flashlight techniques, but the ones you are about to see are the most common. Flashlight techniques can be divided into two categories, hands together or hands apart with each category offering distinct advantages and disadvantages. The hands together technique allows for a two-handed firing grip, but sacrifices flexibility in application for incremental gains and stability. Hands apart techniques give the operator greater options when shooting around cover and when moving laterally while firing, but offer no support for the firing hand. Hands together techniques require that the light be held in front of the center of mass. This fact is not an issue when conducting routine searches or when the subject is not an immediate threat or has already been contained. However, when engaging an active firing threat in dark conditions where you would not normally be visible to the threat, it is probable that the threat will fire at your light and therefore your center of mass if given the opportunity. Both hands together and hands apart techniques have their place and both should be practiced accordingly in as realistic conditions as possible. The first flashlight technique is the Harry's technique. Named after the late Michael Harries, a pioneer of practical combat shooting, the Harries technique is one of the most popular of the hands together techniques. The Harries was originally developed for use with large bodied flashlights, but works equally well with today's smaller tactical lights. To employ the Harries technique, the flashlight is held in an ice pick grip while thrusting the hand forward, then crossing the light under the gun arm and placing the backs of the hands against each other to create stabilizing isometric tension. For large flashlights, the body of the flashlight may be rested on the shooting hand's forearm. The thumb or finger operates the on-off switch, whether it's a tail cap push button or a body mounted push button. This technique works well for shooters who prefer a weaver or modified weaver or Chapman position. The pros of the Harry's technique are, it works well with small or large flashlights, it aligns the flashlight beam automatically with the weapon's muzzle, it enables a two-handed support of the handgun, it is less fatiguing for extended use with a heavy flashlight as the light can rest on the shooting hand's forearm. And finally, it is ergonomically compatible with the weaver stance. The disadvantages of this technique are the displacement of the light beam from point of aim during firing, the proximity of hands increases the chances of a sympathetic contraction and or hand confusion, either of which could result in an accidental discharge, the chance of muzzle sweeping the flashlight hand or forearm during employment, 
This technique can lead to self-blinding when a right-handed shooter attempts to navigate a corner or wall on his right side. The light is located at the shooter's center of mass. And finally, it provides poor ergonomics for anything but the weaver stance. The Chapman Technique Named after Ray Chapman, who won the world's first pistol championship in 1975. With this technique, you hold the flashlight in a sword grip and bring the flashlight alongside your gun. The thumb and forefinger grasp the light and your other three fingers wrap around your shooting hand. The major problem with this technique is that it was designed when a majority of flashlights had the on-off button on the side of the flashlight, unlike today's tactical flashlights, which have the button on the end of the light. Next, we look at the Ayub technique. Developed by shooting instructor Masad Ayub, the Ayub technique is a hands-together method for side-switch type flashlights that utilizes isometric tension to stabilize the gun and light. The technique is best used for fast and dirty, close-range situations, and many users find that it is not the best method for shooting at assailants beyond a few feet. To employ the Ayub technique, grasp the flashlight in a sword grip with the thumb or any finger on the side-mounted on-off switch, then thrust both the light and the gun out to approximate an isosceles position with both thumbs touching. The thumb of the flashlight hand is pressed against the thumb of the weapon hand, creating isometric tension that steadies the weapon. Pros to this technique are, it requires less training than other methods, it aligns the beam automatically with the weapon's muzzle. The cons are, use is limited only to side switch flashlights, the alignment of the beam and barrel displaced during firing, the position can be fatiguing for extended use, especially with heavier flashlights, the proximity of hands increases the chance of a sympathetic contraction and or hand confusion, either of which could result in an accidental discharge. And finally, light is located at the shooter's center of mass. The next flashlight technique is the Rogers technique. Developed by former FBI agent Bill Rogers, this technique allows the shooter to maintain a close approximation of a normal two-handed firing grip. The flashlight is held between the first and second fingers of the non-firing hand in a syringe grip with the tail cap push button resting against the palm or base of the thumb. The flashlight is then brought together with the weapon hand and the two unused fingers of the light hand wrap around the gripping fingers of the weapon hand as in a normal two hand firing grip. To activate the light, pressure is exerted to depress the tail cap push button against the palm or base of the thumb. The pros to this technique are, it aligns the beam automatically with the weapon's muzzle, it allows for two-handed support of the pistol, and it closely approximates a normal two-handed firing grip. The disadvantages of this technique are, it only works with small push-button tail-capped equipped flashlights, the displacement of the beam from a point of aim during firing, the proximity of hands increases the chance of a sympathetic contraction and or hand confusion, either of which could result in an accidental discharge, trying to align the flashlight beam with the target can alter the alignment of weapon with the target, and finally, the light is located at the shooter's center of mass. The next flashlight technique is the FBI Modified Technique. With this technique, the flashlight is held in a sword or ice pick grip with the arm extended well away from the body and the gun hand. Often, the technique involves extending the arm upward with the flashlight held slightly in front of the body so as not to illuminate the user. Possibly the oldest formally taught flashlight and gun technique the FBI technique was originally emphasized as a way to prevent the user's flashlight from marking his exact position. By moving the light away from the user's body, an assailant who shot at the light would be less likely to hit the agent. Many advocates of hands-together techniques view the FBI technique as outmoded. However, this technique has proven to be very effective for room clearing and dynamic close quarters engagements, as it allows the light to be activated away from the body at varying heights without changing the position of the weapon in the opposite hand. Some of the advantages of this technique are, it works equally well with both small and large flashlights, it eliminates displacement of either the beam or the firing grip upon firing, it allows searching with the flashlight without aligning the muzzle with the beam, a consideration for anyone who might encounter a no-shoot situation during a search, the peripheral light can be used to illuminate the front and rear sights, it minimizes exposure during room clearing or firing around obstacles, it is less likely to draw fire to center of mass, and additionally, it is easy to use when applying the principle of intermittent use of light at random heights. Some disadvantages include, it limits the user to shooting one-handed, it is difficult to maintain alignment of the beam on the threat, 
It can be fatiguing for extended use, especially with heavier flashlights, and it is hard to use with an injured hand or arm. And finally, instant alignment of the flashlight beam with the target requires extensive practice. The final technique is the neck index technique. The neck index technique seems to get more popular by the day and can be used with most flashlights whether they're big or small and whether the pressure switch is on the end of the light or the side. You use the ice pick grip for this technique and hold the flashlight right below your ear and close to your jaw and neck. An obvious disadvantage of this technique is that the flashlight is directly next to your head, so if a bad guy is shooting at the light, you're in trouble. In order to provide our officers with equipment to help keep them safer and do their jobs more effectively, all officers are being issued a weapon-mounted light to be carried and utilized while carrying their firearms as authorized by departmental policy. The issued light is the Streamlight TLR-1. This light is designed as an auxiliary light and should not be used as a primary flashlight. Use is limited to illuminating targets in low-light situations which require the officer to have his or her firearm drawn. It should be noted that the TLR-1HL provides a powerful beam. When operated for a long time, it will get uncomfortably warm. This is normal, and it is not a defect. Any LED flashlight of similar size and performance will produce similar amounts of heat during operation. The only way to reduce operating heat is to significantly lower the output or increase the size of the flashlight. While this heating may trigger the drop reflex if an unintended hot light is picked up, the temperature does not present a burn hazard. When used tactically for short periods of time to clear a room, check for intruders, etc., heating will not be a problem. Before attaching, inspecting, or servicing your firearm mounted TLR-1. First, remove the magazine from the firearm, and second, open the action and inspect the chamber to be sure it is empty. It is imperative that safety measures be employed at all times while handling the firearm. There are times that you may have to remove and remount the light on your weapon. For example, when you replace the batteries or when you clean your weapon after shooting. However, before you do this, make sure that the firearm is unloaded and the breech is open. It is imperative that safety measures be employed at all times while handling the firearm. The TLR-1 is designed to be quickly attached or detached from the side of the weapon or accessory rail. To do this, first loosen the rail clamp tension bolt. Next, you must angle the TLR-1, placing the fixed portion of the rail clamp against any accessory rail, and align the rail key with the appropriate cross groove in the accessory rail. Thirdly, depress the tension bolt to open the rail clamp, rotate the TLR-1 into place, and release the pressure on the tension bolt to snap the light in place. Next, check for proper fit and tighten the tension bolt until the TLR-1 is securely attached to the firearm. In order to obtain sufficient tightness, a coin should be used. To operate the TLR-1, simply rotate the ambidextrous paddle switch located at the rear of the light with the thumb of your support hand. This will provide either momentary or constant activation depending on which way you rotate the switch. It is not recommended to use the trigger finger of your weapon hand because if you are using the momentary lighting and you should need to fire your weapon, the light will go off when you remove your finger to depress the trigger. It is highly recommended that you practice both constant and momentary lighting in a safe environment to gain muscle memory should you be involved in a stressful situation. To replace the batteries in the TLR-1, the TLR-1 must be removed from the firearm before the battery compartment can be opened or closed. Again, utilize safe weapon handling procedures when doing this. Step 1. Unlock. This is accomplished by applying force and pushing the latch toward the key until the latch touches the body. Step 2. Swing door open, after lifting the door to remove tab from the slot. Step 3. Replace the batteries. The polarity is indicated on the body of the light. Step 4. Insert the tab into the slot to close the door. Note, replacement batteries are available from your assigned captain. Remember, the weapon mounted TLR-1 is an additional light that is provided for your safety. It is not intended to replace your flashlight or to be used as your primary searchlight. Just as any piece of equipment, it can fail, and you should have a backup plan should this occur. This concludes the classroom portion of the low light firearms training. Please remember, when practicing these techniques, always exercise safe firearms handling techniques. Should you have any questions, contact one of your department's firearms instructors. Thank you for your attention, and remember, stay safe out there. Congratulations! You have completed the video portion of this training module. Now, head to topic number two and pass the quiz with an 80% or higher to receive credit for taking this course. Yeah.